but also it is serves as an instrument to define our politics through political education we constantly define our politics uh, clarify our politics give a cogency to our political vision our political praxis and so on and so forth it helps to build our campaigns and avoid spontaneity fanon has an entire chapter in the Wretched of the Earth, dedicated to the dangers of spontaneity and the forms of violence that are not the revolutionary violence. Uh, so political education is what will help us come up with a program of action that will lead uh, into revolutionary violence or a political action that results into a shift of the change of balance of forces. Number six... Political education protects the organization from inconsistency and opportunism. When we were starting the EFF, there was a highest height of rampant opportunism uh, of people that we used to characterize as staff riders who wanted to hijack the red wave for nefarious and sometimes quite outrightly reactionary interests and dilute uh, the EFF. Uh, so, but also consistency, to be able over the 10 years to be consistent. What helps us is political education, is a constant going back and forth uh, and, 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 and reminding ourselves of our political line. Finally, it helps the organization to live beyond the sum of its individuals and to live forever. I thought the DP would have emphasized here yeah, that it is actually political education that helps us to turn ourselves from mobilizers into organizers. Because there's a difference between the people who mobilize. Mobilization is easy. Mobilization is temporary. We can all get out and mobilize about electricity, uh, about the, 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 for an example, in France, there is a mobilization happening that we shouldn't allow them to reduce the years at which we can take pension. We mobilize over that single issue. Uh, but organization lasts forever. Organization is not mobilization. It's what remains after the mobilization. And political education is what helps us because... When we are politically educated, we are able to translate mobilization into organization. The organization lasts forever. It must last forever. It must last, long. it must last longer than those who started it. It must last longer than Malema, Shivambu, and all the 1,200 delegates of the founding conference in uh, so way to on the thirty on the 20, in 2013 26 July is what will make us live forever is political education. I'm emphasizing these DP because I'm uh, I'm uh, very convinced that indeed they will go into the exam. <laughs> yeah, the the three sevens of the EFF, seven cardinal pillars, seven organizational principles. And for you as political education officers, the seven reasons why political education is important. What I'm going to do in the, in the next few minutes is very easy, is to give us a quick brief, a, a quick and brief history of the EFF. The following sessions that we're going to engage in already should inform you of how do you conduct a political induction workshop? It should ordinarily start with the brief history of the EFF. Where does the EFF come from and what caused it into being? How did we come to constitute this vehicle, this engine of change that we call the EFF? And I think as a point of departure, is important to say that the EFF's birth date is the 26th of July 2013. 
every single member of the EFF should internalize this because it's our birthday. 26 July 2013. The EFF was formed or founded on the 26th of July 2013. However, the Economic Freedom Fighters is part of a long struggle. It's part of a long struggle for the liberation of the oppressed of South Africa and Africa in general. Whose oppression starts with colonization and the capitalist organization of society that came with colonization, particularly industrialization. So we situate ourselves in the long struggle against colonization for the liberation of black people and the oppressed in general. So in this long history, we acknowledge that we are not the first ones to have to confront these oppressors or oppressive conditions. That the first people who fought against colonization uh, were the indigenous African communities in what were called colonial wars of dispossession, in which our people were essentially being dispossessed fundamentally of the land of their settlement and their wealth in a form of live stock. We situate ourselves in that long tradition of struggle. In the 1800s in particular, this struggle saw massive genocides, massacres, and displacements of indigenous African people, the bringing about of slaves, and some of them were turned into slaves, the bringing about of indentured labor from Malaysia, from India, to come and work in the sugar canes as well as in the very many plantations of the white people that had conquered our people, pushing them back into the inner lands, if not massacring them and subjecting them into genocide. In the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, these theaters of the struggle culminated in the first unitary state of South Africa, which is the Union of South Africa, which was formed in 1910. And this particular government explicitly excluded black people as formal citizens of itself. It was the first unitary territorial unitary South African white supremacist and white exclusive state presiding over a black majority following a war which they now tell us that is a South African war but it was a war between white people in which everybody and everything was used and it was in service of white supremacist interest on both sides the British Anglo-Boer War, the Anglo-Boer War, in which the British won, managed to conquer the rest of the country and establish the white supremacist state. Following this white supremacist state, the first liberation movement in the continent was formed in 1912. And this formation of the first liberation movement was in and of itself a response to now the new condition and the new terrain and circumstance of struggle. That there was now a single state in which everybody, there was no longer one state in Natal or one state in the free state, you know, dominating Sutu people or some state of the Transvaal dominating certain sections of uh, the black people. There was now a single state dominating all black people which solidified a unitary identity in which we could all then, as black people, as Africans, you know, unite under and fight back. Uh, and so the African National Congress comes out of that reality and constituted itself as the first liberation movement in the continent. 
And they engaged in the first part, most of the time, in petitions. They were writing letters and post office. They were sending delegations and so on and so forth to try and persuade racists. And it's important to understand here that racism is not about argumentation. A racist does not think that you are below them because you are not smart. A racist, sometimes they themselves are proper fools. A racist thinks you are not equal to them because of the color of your skin. Something you cannot argue for or change. And for the first at least 30 years of these petitions, of these persuasions, it was clear that racists, you cannot even prove by going into history and researching some civilization of Mapungubwe or Timbuktu that you were involved in, that will not give you a certificate of equality in front of a racist. You cannot pass science better than them. You cannot know medicine better than them. Knowing anything better than white people does not give you a certificate of equality. And therefore, it had to be change of tactics. And we all think, uh, we all believe that the changing tactics came. And this is important for what I will say later on in the 1940s with the injection into the liveliness of the liberation struggle by the generation of the Congress Youth League led by Lu, uh, 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 Anton Lembede, A. Pimdam, Olis Majombozi, Mandela. They constituted, initially, actually, they said, uh, if our vision to radicalize the African agenda does not pass in the NC, we're going to go and start a new political party. Something that most people don't actually appreciate. And because we're being very brief tonight, I will not delve into the nitty-gritty, but they did manage to, uh, under Dr. Kuma, get the Youth League recognized as part and parcel of the NC. And that launched a program that took the ANC into a mass movement, which now engaged in organized protest actions, defiance campaigns, deliberately defying unjust laws, willing to put their bodies on the line to raise the profile of the oppressed majority, to raise the profile of their grievances. This occurred for at least 20 years until in Sharpville, 1960, when apartheid massacred the people who were doing the same thing under the banner of the PAC mostly uh, against past laws. When apartheid killed them, already there were conversations because of massive arrests, massive tortures that had been happening in the defiance campaign arrests. There were signs of an oppressive police state that was willing to kill in defense of apartheid. But in 1960, it was a clear international example that there had to be change in tactics. Military uh, 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 tools or a, milit a decision to take on apartheid militarily was taken. The liberation movement was banned. The liberation movement was disallowed, including the Communist Party, and majority of its leadership either arrested in Robben Island or in exile, or they went underground. And there was an engagement, as it were, and a decision to form several armed wings of the liberation movement uh, in the PAC as well as in the ANC. The 1960 had relatively a difficult time in the country, and the struggle would re-emerge in the center's of higher learning. It would re-emerge through the student movement. And this generation was by and large a generation that was not guided directly by the liberation movement outside. Uh, so your Steve Biko, your Bani Pikiana, and the rest of that generation of the black consciousness movement did not have direct links. Apartheid had almost managed to cut ties politically 
uh, between society in South Africa and the key elements and the key activists and the key leaders, uh, as well as the key formations, almost as if it had been destroyed, almost as if the theaters of the 50s, the formations that had taken place, including the trade union movement, as if they had been totally destroyed. So we locate ourselves in this long tradition, and it's important to be able to narrate it because these are our heroes. We claim this history as our heritage, as the EFF. We are not from uh, the blue. We come and we trace ourselves and the grievances that we will ultimately be talking about when we speak to the founding manifesto when you hear. It is the language of over 200 years. It is the grievances of over 200 years that remain to this day unfulfilled. So the student theater, the theaters of struggle in the centers of higher learning that took the form of Sasso had a significant outburst in 1976 when majority of these student leaders in the universities got expelled, banned. Some of them decided to go and teach in high schools. And there they translated the message to teenagers like Tietz Machinin. And these teenagers took the mantle of black pride and resisted the imposition of Bantu education using Africans that was being planned to be imposed as a medium of instruction. They used that to plug back the anti-apartheid struggle into society. Few years before that, another important event at the 1973 Durban strikes. The 1973 Durban strikes, it's important because this year is an anniversary, by the way, of the 1973 Durban strikes. The trade union movement as well, you know, exploded in Durban when workers were demanding better living conditions. These twin towers, the workers on one side and the students, Blacked back the liberation struggle, the demand for the liberation of South Africa, the ending of apartheid. Put differently, the ending of white minority rule uh, into the agenda of, of the country and particularly black people. The 1980s were worse. In the 1980s, you had your Val uprising which resulted into two states of emergencies and the whole country saw a big, big, big protest movement. The UDF was involved, Kosatu was born, uh, your Kosas, uh, and ultimately uh, uh, centers of people's power, the, the youth movement or what we're called the general chatterist on one side as well as there were theaters of people's power resisting apartheid on all sides. Sports boycotts as well as all forms of cultural boycotts, consumer boycotts. These intensified in the 80s and apartheid fell on its knees. The fall of apartheid starts in 1990 with the concessions by the clerk open concessions and banning of political parties, relaxing of political activism in the country. The ANC comes back, the PAC comes back, the Communist Party comes back, and apartheid is negotiated with. Two important myths we must immediately blast here. One, it was not the ANC only that made this moment possible. Agreed? It's not the ANC only that made, excuse me, this moment possible. In many ways, there is a way of reading a critically, of critically reading this history in that the ANC was in exile. It had an underground movement. But by and large, it's the people who liberated the ANC from exile. Mandela was in prison. So were many other heroes and heroines. It's the people themselves who went to demand them to be released from prison. In many ways, we've got to emphasize that what is important, what made the important shift in the history of the struggle in South Africa was when the people realized that their own liberators, change happened. 
So, the second myth was there was just a negotiated settlement. There was no war in South Africa. The number of deaths that we can count just even between 1990 and 1994 tell you that there were serious, serious casualties. A lot of people that died by the gun, by the machete, by the axes, where South Africa's liberation was being forged. This is important. And 1994 came. The African National Congress won the elections and inaugurated what we now call the democratic era. This democratic era is based on the fact that we can now all vote and be voted for. We can all participate in South Africa's democratic a political theater. It is based on human rights, the right to life, everybody is equal before the law, and so on and so forth. But immediately the ANC adopted neoliberal macroeconomic policies. Specifically, 1996, they adopted what is called GEAR. So neoliberalism is essentially the idea that in order for the country to develop, government must stay out of business. Government must not develop the economy. It must barely run the schools. It must run the hospitals. It must run, uh, you know, build roads maybe. Uh, and then run the courts, run the army, and let economic development be in the hands of the private sector. As a result, government engaged in massive privatization of its state-owned companies. One. Two, they opened the economy to the world. They took tariffs down, they allowed businesses to go register in the London Stock of Exchange, and so on and so on. And there was a lot of capital flight. Big companies in South Africa left the shores. But also the organization of the local state DP was now being introduced to the tender system. The tender system is part of a neoliberal organization of society in which only private Companies must provide the things ordinarily we expect from government. And this neoliberal, as neoliberal organizing of the state, neoliberal outlook, even in a macroeconomic level, has been sustained and was believed that it's going, number one, to reduce inequalities. Inequalities which were expressed in terms of blacks and whites, Black people everywhere still earn less than what white people earn for doing the same job, having the same qualifications. But in general, inequalities in relation to access to funding, access to human settlement, where we live, access to health care, they believed that these neoliberal policies would resolve this. Number two, that it would create jobs that neoliberalism would create jobs, meaning it would allow investors to come to South Africa and begin a process of jobs, of creating a lot of jobs. Okay? Tabo Mbege used to call them the triple challenges. Uh, and then the last one is poverty, that it would reduce the levels of poverty. But for 20 years, 20 years, industrialization did not happen. Instead, we de-industrialized as South Africa. Majority of the things that we consume, more and more of the things that we were consuming were not coming from South Africa. They were being produced elsewhere, coming as finished products. Big and best example were the new information technology related products. Your cell phones, there's no cell phone that is being produced here. There's no hockey talkie. Okay, let's leave cell phone. We can even go as back, far back as a hockey talkie. The very mic I'm speaking to. But your cell phones, which is a big, massive industry. None, 
majority of the products that make the economy run, that are exchanging in the economy in South Africa, are not produced in this country. More and more of the things that we consume in South Africa, where no, nobody's father, nobody's sister, nobody's brother, cousin, for an example, works in a factory that produces the chair you are sitting on. Including textile, including these bottles of water. And, and this is a crisis because what it meant is that we are consuming things in the country but we are not producing them. So first failure of neoliberalism is that it didn't bring industrialization. Unemployment skyrocketed. In our generation, there are people, DP, who have never worked. Who have never been to work. They don't know what is a salary. People who were born, but the worst ones are the ones in the 90s. People who were born in 94, 96, 98, are 2000 but worse. There is no employment. Employment, unemployment rises by the year in the country. And because you're not industrializing, you cannot have, unem you cannot have, you cannot create jobs. But as a result, there's serious levels of poverty the levels of poverty in South Africa are rising again. But we are finally the most dramatic impact of neoliberalism is the weakening of the South African state, is the erosion of the state, which cannot provide basic services, water. The electricity crisis is linked to the weakening of the capacity of the state. The water crisis that we are seeing in different parts of South Africa is related to the weakening of the capacity of the state to deliver. The state cannot build roads. The state cannot give, cannot run hospitals. It cannot run schools. It cannot run universities. It cannot plan for the kids that are in grade one today, whether they will find in 12 or 13 years university spaces if they want to go to university. It's it, the, ero the biggest damage of neoliberalism is the consistent weakening of the South African state. So, in 2007, we are talking the brief history of the EFF. Before I talk to 2007, that is generally the conditions under which, one, we locate ourselves in this long struggle for the liberation of the oppressed people of South Africa. But secondly, those were the conditions. That's where uh, uh, the organization or that is where this terrain of struggle called South Africa, the conditions that defined South Africa at the time. Now, most of the time, the people that were agitating for change against neoliberalism were using, number one, the Freedom Charter. The Freedom Charter was a 1955 document which outlined how would a liberated South Africa look like. And in the Freedom Charter, when emphasis of the commanding heights of the economy being in the hands of the people through nationalization, meaning the state in South Africa must run the mines, the state in South Africa must have a bank, the state in South Africa must be able to control the commanding heights of the if it is going to undo colonial relations of production. If it is going to undo colonization, if it is going to do a, undo apartheid, if it is going to undermine property relations in favor of the working class. These ideals were not being realized. They were set aside for a neoliberal path. Uh, they used to call it the 1996 class project, which was a basic project of creating the black bourgeoisie. But how do you create a black bourgeoisie? How do you entrust people who oppressed you to develop you? So all these so-called black bourgeoisie were just being turned into puppet blacks like Ramaphosa, who are not engaged in production. All they are are the faces of the wealth they don't know where it comes from. Your BEEs, 
majority of them were not engaged in production of products. So, there was a big conversation from different terrains. There were people outside of the liberation movement agitating in service delivery protests. There were people outside the liberation movement that were beginning new trade union movements because the trade union movement that was linked to the liberation movement was not punishing the liberation movement for its neoliberal insistence. There were lots of youth formations outside that were agitating for a different direction. Inside the ANC in 2007, a new generation of Congress Youth League leaders were elected in Mangawu. 2008, in Mangawu. This generation in 2008 began to agitate in strict compliance with the ideas of the Freedom Charter. They consolidated an economic emancipation program in 2011. In fact, we are told that when the resolutions, after the resolutions were being read, the then president of that youth league, Comrade Julius Malim, said to the DP here, hey, Floyd, these things we are reading here, you and I won't last in the ANC. Very prophetic. I think the mantle of it all was actually much more scarier to the establishment in South Africa was the proposition of expropriation of land without compensation. Remember I said, where did the struggle begin? Colonial wars of land dispossession. And the youth league of the time began to openly campaign for the expropriation of land without compensation, explaining clearly that the commodification of land is the greatest, is the greatest disadvantage for any common purpose to emerge for a people. But it is at that point of liberating the land from being commodified that a lord of development can take root. In these conferences, uh, not only the resolutions were being taken in the form of nationalization, expropriation of land without compensation, comrades got engaged in real programs on the ground, particularly the Economic Freedom March, which, in which they managed to demonstrate how of a mass formation the ANC Youth League and its economic emancipation ideas had taken. And for the first time, some of the capitalists in South Africa were commenting on politics and they were calling them irritating mosquitoes in a tent. It was clear that there was a resistance not just inside the ANC to these ideas, but also from the establishment itself. The establishment was demanding the ANC to deal with its youth league. So on the eve of the centenary of the ANC, uh, these comrades take a clear program of action. They are re-elected. I don't think they lived for a very long time after that. I don't even think a year that they lasted. There were concocted charges against them related to a uh, very basic thing. There are many people in the NC who do very horrible things. They are still in the NC. They don't get expelled. But there were charges that were concocted. And it was clear it was not because of these charges that they were going to be trialed. It was because of the agenda that they were representing. In particular, the fact that in 2012, they were agitating for the removal of the sitting president of the ANC and a new president under the agenda of economic freedom in our lifetime. A set of policies, it was an attempt, DP, of the repeat of what the, nine, the class of 1944 had done with Dr. Kluma. They said, tomorrow we're going to give you a set of ideas you're going to become the president, but under the mantle of these ideas. And we're going to give you a secretary general in the form of um, Walter Sisulu.
So Mbalula was supposed to have been that Secretary General at the time with Khalema Mutlante as the president. Karl Marx would have advised us, DP, that history happens first as tragedy and second as a joke <laughs> or as a farce. We might want to revisit that moment because he could have told us that this time, comrades, you are living. <laughs> that thing of uh, accommodating a radical change was no longer possible with the African National Congress. They were expelled. But that expulsion was an announcement of a rejection of the ideas of economic emancipation, of economic freedom in our lifetime. The second important event in the same centenary year of the ANC was the strike of workers who, by the way, got abandoned by the traditional trade union or neglected by the traditional trade union movement at the time. They were called wildcat strikes in the platinum belt that culminated, if you like, in Margan. It, it's important because the Marikana workers stood on their own and demanded 12,500 and said, we're not going to work, neither are we going to allow anybody to work until we're given a living wage of 12,500. That event in which instead of the government facilitating a resolution by bringing capital on the table, the Falam Commission showed that it was possible for the concession to have been given to workers. Instead of doing that, the African National Congress government, led by Zoma, with Natim Tetwa as the Minister of Police, Ria Piecha, these were the enemies, class enemies, we must never forget them that united to take a decision to respond to Ramaphosa that a concomitant action had to be taken. Those people are not workers, they are criminals. Zuma, Natim Tetwa, Ria Piecha, Susan Shabangu, Ramaphosa. They all conspired to kill workers in Marika. 34 mine workers were massacred in what were more brutal ways than what we had seen, only reminiscent of apartheid times. Thousands of them were arrested, some of them even injured. Some of the first people on the scene were the very expelled leaders of the Congress Youth League. That history needs to be revisited. And we make a mistake, DP, of not producing, of not writing. It's very dangerous. Because there's too much out there about Marikana history, which has already erased the role that yourself, the president, Makaka, and all of them had quintessentially played. But they were arrested, they were harassed. What is critical is that that announced the end. If anything had to tell us that it is over with the ANC, is when the ANC turned its, the guns against black workers who are working in the mines. These two events, and every time the president of the EFF, Comrade Julius Malema, Comrade Floyd Shivambo, would be working in the platinum belt and saying to workers, go back to NUM. Worker, workers would say, but why don't you start your own thing? So the ideas of an independent political party are not original to those that were in the youth league only. Were not unique to those that were in the youth league only. And as a result... When the 2012 conference of the ANC in December solidified the expulsion, solidified that these comrades are expelled from the ANC, it was a confirmation that the ideas of economic freedom in our lifetime 
have to find a new vehicle. And therefore, in, in June, a clarion call was written by the commander-in-chief inviting activists and all South Africans, revolutionaries, to answer the question of what happens to the agenda of economic freedom. In the clarion call, they gave three important options. Option number one, do we remain in the ANC and hope that the ANC will self-correct? And you must underline the idea of self-correction. Can such a beast, in all its characterizations, self-correct? Some of the things will be filled up when we read the founding manifesto about the true conditions of the time. That was option number one. We remain in the liberation movement and hope that it's going to self-correct. The second option was we form some neutral platform, something like an NGO, to continue speaking about these ideas that they may not die. Speaking and agitating about these ideas, but not become a political party so that everybody identifies with us. Some neutral NGO platform uh, movement, but where we try to be, you know, sweethearts to everybody who agrees to this agenda. That was the second option. The third option is we form an independent political party, contest power, take power, contest state power, take state power, and do these things ourselves. Following that, there were massive consultations with youth movements, with workers' movements, with key radicals and activists and militants inside and outside, which culminated in the 26th July 2013 First National People's Assembly to give a conclusive answer to the question, what is to be done? Do we remain in the NC? Do we form a neutral party? A neutral NGO? Call it an NGO for ease. Or do we become an pol independent political party and contest state power? There was a resounding agreement in that evening in Sowe to Uncle Tom's Hall. 26 July. Uncle Tom's Hall in Soweto. We agreed to take the third option. Otherwise, we would all not be here. Yeah. That option means the EFF is a fully-fledged, independent political party that is going to pursue the agenda of economic freedom in our lifetime. In that conference, the conference was constituted by delegates from all over the corners of South Africa, including former mine workers in the Eastern Cape that had been struggling to get help in relation to the ailments that they had been experiencing. They had been retired. They were suffering from TB and all those things. There was a delegation of Marikana workers. Marikana workers in a sense of the survivors of the Marikana massacre. And they spoke at the conference. There were activists from uh, tra other trade union, independent trade union movements, uh, as well as people that came from all walks of life. 1,200 delegates met over three days. One took this decision. Secondly, adopted the founding manifesto of the EFF, which the deputy president is going to take us through, which describes what nature the EFF will be, what will be its strategic mission, and secondly, thirdly, adopted the constitution of the first ever constitution of the EFF and agreed 
about an interim political leadership under the commander-in-chief, Julius Malema. We didn't. We, there was that question posed. How do we proceed from here? We are going to constitute and remain with the central command team in its interim form to take us to elections, which is the final thing. We took a decision, even in that conference, DP, that we are going to contest elections. The elections were in less than eight months. We took a decision we are going to contest elections. We are going to go in 2014 and contest elections. Um, the EFF turns 10 years this year. It's represented in over 230 municipalities. It is official opposition in three provinces. Uh, it has had an amazing, not only political impact in the country, but also an intellectual impact. It has had a serious impact as well in the continent. Everything the EFF does becomes international news. Everything the EFF does brings or takes, makes people in China, in Russia, in the UK, in America, as well as in the continent pay attention. The development of the EFF is a serious international discussion. And that began on the 26th of July, 2016. The last thing to describe here as an important symbol is there was a deliberate decision about the birth date. And as a fighter, you ought to know that. And this deliberate decision will tell you about the symbolism in relation to paraphernalia that we then began to be immediately associate with. It was in the brilliance of these founding members to already in the founding moment symbolically distinguish the EFF from anything that had come before. Everybody had tried this COPE, IFP, UDM. Everybody had tried what we were trying. And everybody was saying we won't make it because there were no Robben Islanders. There were no... Uh, former ministers, former presidents amongst us. There were no former mayors. There were no billionaires. Kenny Kunene had misled us that he has got money. He couldn't pay for a venue that evening. We wanted money. He said, what you said you have money? Pay for Uncle Tom's Hall. Uncle Tom's Hall was 3200 per night. He couldn't pay for it. Uh, so there were no billionaires amongst us. Uh, he was a really fake sushi king uh, that we were even trying to rehabilitate at the time. It's important because this is the reason why they were writing us off. We didn't have anybody. But we plugged immediately in terms of our symbolism. We said we must form this organization. We must take the decision of the formation. Of, we knew that it's going to be the case. Because everybody we spoke to was unequivocal. I never met a person in all the consultative meetings, DP, who was saying, remain. Who was saying, take time. Except David Masson. <laughs> He's the only one who was saying, you are moving too quickly. But what is important is that the 26th July is an anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. 26 July relates to the 26 July movement, which is a movement associated with the Cuban Revolution. The Cuban Revolution is important for us because in Cuba, there was a liberation struggle. And then it liberated Cuba from colonizers, DP. And there was a degeneration and a demagogue dictator called Batista who was collaborating in the serious looting of Cuba with the mafia and capitalist degenerates of the United States. They were, they were trying really to make Cuba into some super Miami. In fact, Miami becomes Miami when, when Cuba fails. Casinos, prostitution, and so on and so forth. And then, 
the demand for economic freedom had not been realized. So there was a movement of young people led by Fidel Castro, Che Guevara, who said we must fight for economic freedom. And they launched a campaign which took a military form and liberated Cuba. That is why we associate, because we think we are inspired that we too, through whatever revolutionary means possible, must fight for the true decolonization of South Africa. We're not going to be content with political freedom. Hence, the, even our founding manifesto says, political freedom without economic freedom is meaningless. So the Cuban revolution is where we take the red beret, is where we take the inspiration of the militancy that informs uh, the EFF. And um, uh, it, it immediately became very viral uh, when it was launched at the press conference. It became immediately viral. And it became, today you can't wear a red beret and think you are not reminding people of the EFF. Even somebody as far as America in the form of um, Rihanna, if Rihanna were to come out with a red beret now, everybody on social media is going to say EFF. That's how we have appropriated and have kept alive that symbol. The colors that are red, all these decisions are critical, comrades. They are the colors of the working class. We are plugging into the history of the workers' struggle. They are the colors of the blood that bleeds every day because of being exploited. And the EFF was formed. So we take inspiration from the Cubans because they themselves took on a gigantic empire. When they were fighting Batista, they were fighting America. Hence, they were isolated. To this day, the Cubans live under a trade embargo because of the Cuban Revolution. But despite all of that, they've experimented with socialism. And it is socialism that has made them not to become a bastardized country, like many countries that... Uh, uh, were destroyed following their resistance. And here, DP, you would know, the thing is, Haiti were the first people to resist the real empire. But socialism there was not the immediate program. And I think socialism, in the instance of Cuba, is what made them to, to have the integrity, the economic organizational integrity that has resisted them for over 50 years from complete annihilation, which makes the case for socialism really big. And finally is that we are a socialist. Our strategic objectives is to achieve socialism, is to change a society in which production services profit for profit's sake, is to inaugurate a society in which production is servicing the needs of the people. That is our strategic objective, is to shake the shackles of capitalist exploitation, where the only way to do production, to do business, is by maximizing profit, or is to do it in the name of profit, or for profit extraction. We want a society in which we can develop industry, we can fulfill people's needs, without extracting profit, and that society is possible. That's how the EFF was formed. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Manja. I'm going to request help from uh, our support staff with the mics. Before, comrades, we proceed, we thought we must hear from you. <clears throat> we'll break at exactly 9 o'clock, 2100 hours, to take dinner. Uh, between now and the dinner, let us take questions or reflection. And you can use whatever language you seem comfortable with. Uh, based on the two inputs that uh, the DP and myself have uh, given. Questions. Clarify yourself. Um, remember, you must go and teach these things. So fill up the corners in your head about this entire thing. Uh, questions. So let's take the first round of, uh, of questions or reflections. So you will be number one. Don't forget your number. Number two, number three, number four, number five and number six. Number seven, number eight, number nine, number ten. Number 11, number 12, number 13, number 14. Let me take one last hand, number 15. So 15 hands, two minutes each, should work. What Thank is the 15 times two? Exactly. So that will finish the 30 minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Thanks very much. So uh, introduce yourself. We are Gepi. Utsuakai, and uh, then you can shoot. Thanks very much, Commissar uh, Mbuiseni Ndlozi. And let me also take this opportunity and greet the Deputy President of the EFF. My name is Fighter Credo Mukhosi. I'm a member of the Regional Command Team of Bujanala. I'm from the Northwest. I happen to be the only councillor who doesn't have a medical aid and adhering to complementary pillar number two of the EFF. Mine is very simple, Commissar, is to ask particularly after you have touched on the Anglo Boer War. I believe maybe you touched on the Anglo Boer War that started in 1899. And the, the Deputy President of the EFF during the COVID-19 uh, political lecture series, I think you remember them, you participated uh, on them also, Commissar, touched like there was a political induction on the history of the EFF. And then I always, you know, go to those recordings, but I don't get the part of the agreement between the, the British and the Boers on what they agreed upon after the British have defeated the Boers, but only to find out that the Boers continue to run business and government as usual in the country. I don't know how and why they gave them power, the, 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 the Boers, and why the British, after they've defeated the Boers, they didn't take power themselves and, and, and lead the country. And one other thing, again, is, is, on, is on the formation of the ANC. Because I've learned that actually the ANC was formed by Britain, was formed by London. Because the majority of them were taken here to London or in America to study before the formation of the South African National Native Congress. So I want you to actually highlight me on how the ANC started, in particular in the year 1908 to 1912, where they started the ANC. Thanks very much, leadership. Thank you. Number two. Uh, thank you very much, leadership. My name is Akola. I'm from um, Mangawong region in the Free State. Um, Commissar, I would love to pose um, three questions which are critical. The first one has to do with bourgeoisie or capitalism. Um, we find it difficult to distinguish between people who are moneyed and capitals or bourgeoisies. Uh, we've been severally asked questions pertaining to our leadership and ourselves that um, we have people who are leading us who are wearing certain brands and driving certain cars. 
So um, I think you can assist us in terms of differentiating between capital and people who are moneyed. And then the second question, um, since you've highlighted the history of the ANC and um, everything that you've came through, there are also questions that are emanating from the ground, which I think you can also assist us to clarify now that we are also live. What people are asking on the ground, why do we continue to form coalition or rather to vote with the very same ANC that keeps on um, betraying people, particularly in some metros. And then the other last one um, um, that is highly criticized when it comes to Africa. We note that the EU has got um, its own union, United I Europeans Union. But when it comes to Africa, it becomes um, now a, an agenda that is rejected and You've stated also that um, this agenda is also despised by the media. Can you please clarify to us the open border policy? What does it really mean? Does it mean our state is, gonna, is not going to have borders or identification of any sort? What does it have to do with trading in Africa since the research proves to us that um, our economy is booming much when, the Af when Africa is trading intrastate? So I think those questions are critical at the moment. Thank you very much. Number three, oh. if we take strict adherence to two minutes, everybody will speak. Thank you very much, Commissar. Uh, my question is, uh, my name is Koketopo from Johannesburg region. Uh, my question relates to the idea of Karl Marx saying that the state is an instrument for advancing the interest of the capitalist class and also the quote of Asata Shoko about uh, your oppressor will never empower you to oppose them. Now, how do we respond as fighters to the accusation that our application of the principle of decoloniality is passive in some instances. Reason being, in Parliament, we problematize constantly. However, in our articulation of the importance of education, it seems as if we are comfortable, as if the syllabus is not itself oppressive and reactionary. So, how do you respond to those accusations? Because sometimes we are accused that the EFF is a passive resistant. It will never empower youth to wage a meaningful revolution. So how do we then defend the organization uh, when it comes to such an accusation? Yes, number four. When are you not paying attention? When? Thank you very much, uh, Commissar. My yeah. name is Lesiba Mutapo. From... Yeah? Yes, sir. Okay. My name is Lesiba Mutapo from uh, Ekurulene. I'm heading the portfolio of uh, political education. Uh, number one, I want to understand the arrival of the machinery here in the continent of Africa, uh, the role that it is, it's playing in the entire continent, and also understand the role of us as EFF because these missionaries, they have established the churches in uh, all in all countries in Africa. And then the main thing is to defocus us from the mainstream of economy and we need to challenge that from the platform of the EFF. Secondly, I also want to get a sense of the, as the military uh, format of EFF because there's a three types of economy which is communist and socialist and a free market. But in EFF's policies, is agitating socialism with a form of military. It seems like it's merging the two. And I want to get the sense of where does the EFF come from with that and also get the clarity going forward. Thank where, you. Where, where is the military in the... Do, do you have anything direct to tell us? Military and socialism. In the EFF, where did you see that? The, the, the policy position of EFF. Yeah, which one? Uh, socialist. Socialist means... Yeah, but, uh, but do you have a document that you read that in? 
the 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 funding manifesto of EFF. Funding oh. manifesto of EFF. It says we want military socialism. We want uh, socialism, and then uh, the type of the policy is different from 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 the the communist policy, because communist policy, it's a total control of the government, and then uh, socialist is the mix of private sector and the the the, the government. So in uh, the structures of EFF. It's also agitating that with a communist and command format. So I want to get a sense of why is it taking that shape? Because socialism is an independent policy. The other one is uh, also independent. Thank you so much. Okay. Number five. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Uh, fellow concerns and fighters, uh, and greetings to the DP as well. Uh, Commissioner Dr. Androzi, I yes, think sir. you spoke large uh, about the... We're not going to man. Oh, I forgot to introduce myself. My apologies. Yeah, my name is Mpo uh, Morokon. I'm from Gangala, regional chairperson. Yes, sir. Yeah, I really do not have a lot to ask, but I, I want to appreciate what was said uh, by the deputy president in relation to uh, a lot of uh, political uh, education that we need to learn from, particularly uh, some of the points that he has made, quoting uh, the Che Guevara the f and, and other, other uh, political, uh, what you call. So let me just quickly go to what I want to ask. Uh, Commissar, there is, there is the issue of the media. You know, when he was talking, outlining the history about the formation of the EFF, where we come from, and then where we are now. I think, I don't know, how do you, how can you assist to describe for us the relationship between the media, particularly in South Africa, and, 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 and the EFF? So I don't know if I should go back to where the DP was talking about the capitalist state, the class, the two classes in South Africa, in the capitalist state, when he spoke about the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, media actually, who do they represent there? I just want to understand something. Because I'm saying this because recently now, when the EFF had to embark on the EFF national shutdown, media was very critical against the EFF, saying a whole lot of negative things about the the EFF and those journalists, if you look at you look at them, they are also affected by the system, by this capitalist system. So I want us to be taught much in the process uh, about the relationship the EFF has with the uh, media in South Africa. Thank you very much. Number seven. <laughs> are you not number seven? So he's next. Yeah, go on. We are on number seven, ain't it? Oh, that's fine. I, I think the mistake was that he can start. No, you can go, go, go. Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Good evening, uh, Deputy President uh, and uh, Consul Bissen Jose. My name is Wilson Lenin Chauke. Yes, sir. The Regional Secretary of Harris Band in Mpumalanga. Um, Mine is to say, as you started presenting uh, Consantos, I thought I was going to have a lot of questions. But honestly speaking, after you have presented, I'm shocked because I'm left with no question whatsoever. I've just realized that as much as I thought I knew the foundations of the EFF, how it began, I thought maybe these comrades just got shown the door and they had found an alternative, but it was not like that. It was something that originated right deep into the movement carrying out to where we are today. If it was in a Pentecostal church, you could have found me saying, go deeper, Papa, and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm really uh, a little bit uncomfortable now because I, I seem like I'm praising him, but I'm not. This is the reality. Thank you, Commissar. I understand now why you are at the head of this political education. We will uh, get quite a lot from you. 
I'll go on to the two questions that I've prepared. Uh, one is a question, one is an observation. The observation that I've done through the uh, dialectic materialism pyrotechnics from the deputy uh, president is to say the world as it is, is a pedestal of a battle of ideas that controls the mode of production, best described as West and East, including their allies. And each uh, that attains the pinnacle uses it to influence, to demonize the other. Communist China and communist Cuba battles with all its heart. And in the same way, the capitalist America, once it has got an opportunity, wants to prove that communism is an all evil. But this is just about a battle of ideas to control the means of production. Your two now I go is, to uh, it's uh, the observation that I made. Around your two minutes the, is about to. Okay, that's fine. J just a quick question then. During the revolutionary struggle for freedom, our poorly funded struggle frameworks regularly send cadres to communist countries such as USSR, Romania, Cuba, and China to learn communism firsthand in practice. Why is it that as the left-leaning movement, we are failing to appreciate the same feat and send young aspiring minds to China, Russia, and other communist-driven governments to learn communist and socialism firsthand? Thank you. Yes, uh, in that order. Uh, thank you, Commissars. Uh, I'm Naito Kolanisi from Eastern Cape, uh, from the region of Sosbini Tunzi, uh, or Tambo. Um, in honest fact, um, uh, uh, Commissar Dr. Ambrosi, you were a bit sangomastic because you touched on some things that um, I really wanted to put on light here. However, I have some questions that I've drafted. Um, if we look at pre-apartheid days, uh, we look at the Sharpeville massacre, the Soweto uprising, and then we move to the post-apartheid days, which is the Marikana massacre, the July unrest, which uh, happened uh, not so long ago in Durban. Um, then two days ago, if I'm not mistaken, the EFF shut down. Now, we have seen post pre -up, um, in the days of apartheid, the army being deployed to civilians. Even post-apartheid days with these events that have just uh, um, locked down uh, with an exception of Marikana, the army has been deployed on civilians. Are we not facing, or is our state not inheriting what is called an animal farm style of uh, a state where the army is actually unleashed on the very same civilians that are urged to vote for the same government. Two, what is our take on the sunset clause that was proposed by um, Joe Slovo during the um, Kodesa negotiations? Um, three, um, in, in, in your observation, do you think that the uh, ANC has ever had a moment where it could self-correct. I'm saying this based on the memorandum that um, 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 that got um, um, Chris Hani um, in, in, in hot water, which uh, was the same memorandum that led to the Morocco conference. <clears throat> and then um, second last question, I'd like to concentrate on the um, uh, um, um, the, 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 the death or the um, sudden decline of, um, of, of BAC. Don't you think that um, the death of BAC was in result of um, lack of political education to on, on its masses? Then last question, very important. Um, we have heard everything that uh, has been presented so well, but I would like um, for you, commissars, to actually um, tell us or teach us on the role of Mama Winnie, um, uh, Mama Winnie's uh, contribution uh, in the struggle against apartheid and post-apartheid. Thank you. Next.
Uh, thank you very much, Commissar. I think uh, give him because he's here <laughs> and he's lost now. So we'll come back to you. Ngosi Commissar, I am on board. We are going to be able to capture the West American Commissar. Nam dina yoi concern iglando ye ye trade union koba ke lamtun bolei pat desk ichuba umba noen oh sorry ti gukieta o sevwe kieta Eastern Cape i RCT member ye 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 se Christian okay we lam lamtun bi ubuka ubuzwa ema Amerikana komisa we bolei pat desk koba ke lamtun bi we we nasika. You were trade union. But I'm going to be able to get I want to be able to get a rich in Kana. I'm going to be able to So, and that's the FF by EOT. He for me in the labor desk. And goes. A labor desk, no me trade union. Sorry, trade union. Okay, and goes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissar. My name is Moali Ramarwa. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Vembe Region. <laughs> I have two questions. The first one relates to the seven cardinal pillars of the economic freedom fighters. Uh, I wanted to understand, particularly in relation to the Freedom Charter, uh, 1955, it would seem that the African National Congress had betrayed the commitments of the African people and what they were fighting for in that they negotiated at a particular point, one would believe. But I wanted to understand, as we go into elections next year, um, looking at the non-negotiable pillars and the Freedom Charter, we're going to have to, if uh, what many believe would be a coalition government, have to sit with the same people who have the same ideologies that they just put under the shelves or under the table for years, we're going to have to sit with them. Does it not make it difficult for us as an organization perhaps because we go in there um, with the time for the second question to make the first question more clearer? We've got uh, seven cardinal pillars and the African National Congress had those same ideologies before uh, the time came for us to go into the democratic era. Uh, when we go for elections next year and perhaps we have to form a coalition government, does it not make it difficult for us to uh, form a coalition government with the same organization that has those same ideologies but chose to abandon, abandon them. them and become complacent? Got you. Thank you. Next. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Simon Mangena from uh, Mopane region, the chairperson of Mopane region, Lempopo province. I'm interested in the, the reading that uh, you gave to us, uh, Commissar uh, Dr. Ngozi. Uh, you said the land was taken from our, our people through genocide and many people were killed in the process and those who couldn't resist were driven away to the inner lands and most of that land is barren. We cannot even plant food on it. Since the, the EFF attempted to get section 25 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa amended failed, what is it that we are going to do as the EFF to make sure that our forefathers land is getting returned without compensation? Are you done? Okay. You, you may want to maybe repeat the question. Section 25 does what? Just the question. What does okay. the question say? Since the EFF attempted to get Section 25 of the Constitution of the Republic mm -hmm. amended, has failed. What is it that we are going to do as the EFF to ensure that the land is returned I without see. compensation? Excellent. Next. 
I think it's Rasi. Oh, yeah, yeah, somewhere here. Uh, don't jump the gun. It will not jump you. Why, yeah, Mama? Pam sends Zandla Pelanan, Nabo Ekta Shai. Yes. No, thanks very much, uh, Commissar, and greetings to the DP. My name is Austin Mabasa from Mopane region. Uh, my question is uh, when it comes to the Clarion call, when it was uh, pronounced, I think it was in 2012 when you were giving the, the history, uh, is to get clarity to say the three questions that we what is to be done? It was questioned when there was expulsion or it was before the expulsion when these three questions were, 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 were discussed, what is to be done? And the second one, I want to know in terms of the, the national anthem that we, we sing in the EFF, uh, I heard you said it's composed by Inok Santonga. Uh, I don't know when exactly the, the original one is the one that we sing in the EFF and the one that it's sang by a South African, which has got English and Africans who composed that just to get clarity. Good. Uh, next one. MLLA, Chief, you have a question? Yes. Bo Jamba. Banyaga di Yoba Tua. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, my name is uh, Faita Tudeis Mulefe. I'm a deputy chairperson of the region in Waterbeck, Limpopo province. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank you to bring back my, my conscience when it comes to other events. I wish one day uh, the link that we have put here from 2008 uh, to 2016 events can also be profiled because uh, I believe they can be very interesting uh, case studies of our revolution. Um, one, um, I, I want to check how, though you didn't touch much on it, but how do we make sure that um, our, local, our local and continental politics vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the belief on the ground uh, from the South African people's uh, context towards the opening of borders uh, how how do we how do we plan uh, to do that? At the same time, on the same question, um, does the EFF believe on on doing it after maybe we consolidated uh, by 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 launching uh, EFF structures in the continent, or does the EFF want to? do it through the existence of other political parties, maybe who have the same belief that we have. So uh, for us to achieve um, the open borders, or do we just want to open borders and see where it takes us? Um, the other question is that, uh, what do we do? Because now, South Africa, we must accept that uh, coalition government Will, 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 will continue to exist um, in other areas where we don't make um, a, a deeper inroad uh, politically through ballot. Um, what, what are we doing in, uh, around changing of laws? Um, because the electoral system now, the quota sometimes leave you with more numbers um, and others with less, sometimes give you less and others with more, and they are forced to bring numbers into the, uh, the, the, constitu uh, the constitution of the uh, municipal councils. What do we do in the current form to prepare for the next um, round of election, particularly in terms of your structures act and other laws that form local government, including in parliament? How far are we ready to govern on our own or how far are we ready to govern um, on, 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 on coalition government without depending on committees 
of the ANC and the DA. Lastly, um, uh, Commissar, though uh, the, it was asked, but I didn't understand it, uh, this question. Uh, how ready we are on, on forming a trade and alternative trade union? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next. There should be three last hands. Thank you very much, uh, Commissar. My name is uh, Rasima Epa. Mm. I'm the deputy chairperson of the EFF in Limpopo. And greetings to the deputy president. My mine is not a, a question per se, but I've heard when the uh, Commissar was uh, in the first part of his presentation speaking about the how the oppression, uh, how colonialism was started or became an oppression of the uh, uh, black majority of our people. The, there was a, a, a 1906 uh, Bambata rebellion, which was a, a rebellion in Natal where uh, Kim Bambata, Maganzinza was a, uh, mobilizing the people there to fight against the rule of the, Brit the British and the question of uh, Texas. And, and now, this was done in 1906, and Pixley started to mobilize the, people, the African people to start the South African Native National uh, Congress uh, in around 1909 uh, for the formation of the South African uh, Native National Congress in 1912. Now, in the, um, through the eye of the needle, written by the ANC, they capture the Bambata Rebellion as one of the events uh, made by um, the African National Congress. So I want, I want the, 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 the doctor to help me to reconcile the Bambata Rebellion into uh, the formation of the ANC and the, the struggle to, li to liberate our people. Thank you. Uh, next. Nyabonga uh, Akulu. My name is Stembe uh, Sotetwayo, an RCT member in King Kichwa Origin, KZN. Fortunately, most of the questions cover in Shigiri. Excellent, you took pen. What him a history as he as he provided a lawyer on a lot when you see till the velocity present a lawyer on a approved good a ama interactions in general. You want a creator a ama totalities a and a John was born in the is in the sense of an eye so man a bit unpack to hotel. From the beginning, you see, Uti, Aiki totally, Aiki reality, Kamuksi Kamu. They are all as a result of my interactions. Now, a part of these historical interactions that created Lama totalities of today now is the formation of the IFP a, in the name of Zulu nationalism. Sare Satu Gutinta, we plan a question and uh, respond there, but because we're in this platform, Besna Jabula Masnati, Ugati, Putisna Tilaranja and Alentuli, Yoguti, a Abandu, Bawazul Natali, they are subjected uh, to the I, 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 I monopole, I would say. Yes, no one have monopole on traditional leadership, but IFP in case of 10. Uh, the so-called President Emeritus uh, uh, of the IFP uh, or, or represent my ideals of the IFP uh, in KZN uh, is the Prime Minister in KZN of the Zulu Nation. So he has that traditional legitimacy in KwaZulu Natal. So it's Ganganguti Ungabona IFP and I conduct programs like these ones, political education, none, none. 
but there was actual expression in our communities because the way they have a monopoly in our traditional leadership in the hands of the machine of the footy aban bagiti they they respect in traditional leadership in tech born in killer my community say it would be respect traditional leadership in kata it can see influenza nanga bonagala but they push the ideals of zulu nationalism and then we find it difficult to to yes we do but we do convey the messages of the EFF but the anti-as pazam is so how can we deal with that how can we solve that problem you go to present emeritus of a certain party but at the same time was subjected to his leadership as a prime minister of the Zulu nation and then yeah nkabangu ti emi nyimbuzi kave gili masinga Bambegala po, ya bo. Frina? I haven't spoken. Thank you very much. Uketa wama kanya from Milembe region. Ekeze zeni. So, this is just a clarity seeking question. Even though I was going to research it myself, but then when the opportunity comes, I just decided to ask it. So, my question is here. If, like, I, I heard very well, uh, Doctor, you said, uh, I introduced myself. My name is Ketama Kanya from Ilembe region, Kezeten. Thank you. Uh, if I heard very well, uh, you said it is the generation of the NCU League around 1994 that actually came with an idea of involving the masses in the structure against uh, uh, resistance. In the strike against yes, uh, what, what was happening that time. So, it, my question is here: yeah, Was the formation of ANC League initially for true total liberation of all people, or it was just a, a thing of a certain a group of people? Because even when I check uh, the first leadership of ANC, the likes of uh, Abo. Those comrades were very educated, and Gadaska Tabamia it was something gay, Kakuluk Bantu, Ababe, Ababe Rich. So that's the clarity that I need. If Kuguti a Gigzuega talked. The second question is here. I think a very, we are not live here. It's about it's Ilojana. It's it is in relation with Ilojana the the program that we had May twenty. Where our learning economy, I can say. And even on our side, as fighters. Noticed as our shortfall is EFF for Kutumanga. Next time, is here Kuma Kuma mass program. I can't join a in a SB a book of a be a mass shortfall. Just going now, it may see long is if ever again. The next time, see engage a Kuma programs. I can't join. That's my second question. Thank you. Do Melan Commissar. Um, Kaleboha, thank you very much. My name is Lynette and Debo. I'm from uh, Tembisa in Winnie Mandela. Yes. Named after Mama Winnie, of course. Um, I'm from Watri. Um, thank you for narrating uh, our history of the EFF so nicely. I felt like as I was listening to that story. It's a history told indeed. Seeing the state of South Africa as our country is turning like uh, Cuban. Um, in the days of Zapatista, uh, at that particular time with uh, Cyril Ramaphosa uh, becoming Batista, taking our rights or wanting to revoke our rights also to protest, using the police also to fight EFF by all means possible. 
what is our plan of being able to fight back and take him back of what is rightfully ours, more especially looking at what transpired during shutdown, whereby our also our rights were also uh, uh, taken away from us of protesting and many of us were injured. And then another question uh, that I have is, how do we protect our history or how can our history be told in the right manner uh, whereby it can never be hijacked by the white people telling the wrong stories about what happened. Like for instance, what you mentioned about Marikane, that the history is not told in the right manner. How do we correct that in order for us to tell the right history? The history of uh, Hoshi Mujaji, the history of Shaga Zulu, how do we correct that because it's told in the wrong manner? The history of Black Panther, how do we also correct that because it's told in the wrong manner? The history of what happened in Blood River, how do we also correct that while there's still time so that for the generation to come, it can learn the history? Because I believe for as much as we are international, Charity begins at home. Our history needs to be known by our people. Immediately when we can know our history, we'll understand also what we mean by also the border gates. So I think it should also be part of our education, our history here in South Africa, to say where do we come from as Africans, from the history of Shaga Zulu. And then another question is that, um, uh, can we please also, um, when you sat down... Uh, our president, when he sat down with our deputy president, looking at the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF, what was the time frame also and the steps to be followed in order to achieve some of the cardinal pillars of the EFF, seeing that some of the cardinal pillars are being achieved, but cardinal pillar number three, which is building states and government capacity, which will lead to abolishment of tenders, is not being established more, especially in, in the ground. I think that should be also the major thing that we can learn about to say where do we start and where do we go, go from there. And then another one is, can you please explain also deeply so the role of Mama Winnie uh, in the EFF? We have Mama Winnie, we sing about her every day, but we don't deeply know about what also transpired. And I think you should also know today that we have Winnie Mandela in an informal settlement there at Tembisa. So that needs acknowledgement also. And then the last one, yeah, I think, yeah, I think I've said everything. Thank you so much. Amanda. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, comrades, for very enlightening questions. I'm going to advise that uh, don't chew the whole cake uh, at a go. Uh, allow yourself to slow down and uh, walk the decorated path. So where are we now? We are in the importance of political education for the conduct of the struggle. And then we are in the brief history of the EFF. As you noticed, I'm really, what I really did is cover the first significant events towards the 26th July. There's a whole 10 years. That's what I'm saying to DP. We have a lot to write because... Between um, 2014 really and now, there's a lot of appropriation uh, in relation to knowledge pro production that has, to ha that has to happen and materialize. We are going to the founding manifesto, the questions of borders, the questions of seven cardinal pillars, the questions relating to um, colonial wars of disposition. Yes, I will try and do something about it now, traditional leadership, they are going to, to come and you will hear firsthand what the EFF says in black and white. Does it make sense? Allow yourself to, to, to go in the lesson. Why I'm saying this is because you must go repeat. You must go and have your own classroom and you must take people on a path so that that path allows them to join the pieces. Uh, so let's see what is possible now. And uh, I'm really saying I'm going to touch on the things that I know for sure may not occur again. Maybe repeat the ones that I think are worth repeating. Coalition questions. 
as well, uh, Deputy President, I will leave them to your constitutional duties as per the Constitution. The governance question in the EFF belongs to the Deputy President. Uh, the communism difference and socialism difference, again, we will be speaking to Marxism tomorrow. You want to be patient with yourself to walk through that path. Um, the media is part of uh, the capitalist superstructures. And I think the best answer, the best direct answer to that is media is owned. Media doesn't exist in some neutral space somewhere. It is owned, and in, this, in South Africa, it's predominantly owned by the same people who own the means of production who want to keep the status quo. So there is very little journalists can do uh, in their independence or supposed independence. Uh, you cannot be independent from who owns you. It doesn't happen. So they will speak in the interest of the establishment. Hence, they, they had the almost same script. All of them, if you listened to their bulletins Monday morning, was it's business as usual, it's business as usual, it's business as usual. And then you would be shocked that also the ANC key figures were saying the same thing. They are almost conducted from the same room. But over and beyond that, um, the, the, the ruling ideas are often the ideas that sustain the status quo. They become the ideas of the ruling class that make them to continue to rule over us. How do we do that? How do we challenge that status quo? Political education. We've got to engage in a battle of ideas by constituting alternative platforms to popularize popular ideas, the ideas that are critical of the status quo. Not, and now it's much more possible than it would have been in the past. But since the information age, you know, comrades, what is the reformation? It was an information revolution, DP. You know, Martin Luther's debate, Martin Luther's rejection of the Catholic Church resulted in the printing of the Bible for everyone. For that, no, all of us can't just say the Bible must be read by the priest and the pope. Everybody must have a Bible. The information age, like the idea of popular information, of print, of the printing press, was very critical critically propelled as well by, uh, by the reformation. So every revolution has to have the capacity to print its ideas, to circulate its ideas. Every shift must also be a shift in terms of the narratives and the ideas. And we won't be able to quite achieve that without subjecting ourselves in the manner that we do now you know the manner in which we go to conferences. Have you seen how many conferences we have? And we stay until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Just waiting for the ballot. We must do that with ideas. We must meet, battle with ideas, battle with ideas. When we write, when we speak, when we persuade people, we're going to be as good as we are when we lobby. Yes, Wagal. So, so to challenge the media... Uh, we've got to do exactly the things we're engaged in, alternative press, alternative social media platforms, and engage and clarify, never be tired, be there in the radios, have our own podcasts, and so on and so forth. It's an interesting question, and I, I would be very interested because it will take us to a lot of, of, of history. I don't know that there was any dramatic improvement in the ANC's conduct of the armed struggle since it, it really happened. I mean, they, there is wanky, and then there's a, a set of underground missions, some of which were very successful and so on and so forth. Uh, as to that, whether that 
allowed the ANC to self-correct ideologically. I, I doubt very much. Because the self-correction we are talking about has to do with the ANC's commitment to a tectonic shift in property relations. I don't think the ANC on its own is going to come to the party. And this relates to the, 19, for the class of 1994 which started the Youth League. It's not 1994, 1944. The 1944 uh, allowed the ANC to transform into a mass democratic movement. Uh, and then it is also in that era that the Freedom Chart, there was a big debate because some of that generation rejected propositions like South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And uh, that's another discussion which resulted in the PAC's formation. But between 1994 and when the generation of the Congress Youth League attempted that shift, there was no hope that the ANC internally, and it hasn't even now, there's no hope that it is going to self-correct. Now the ANC is completely infested by Komtsotis. It's led every, everywhere. It has been totally usurped by Komtsotis with serious, serious opportunism driven by self-enrichment and, uh, and, and well, extremely parasitical but in the end, who resist ideological development? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I think that problem we will face for a very long time in the zigzags that we are busy with in coalitions. Those are not principled conversations. Those are not principled conversations in a sense that they are not strategic questions. They are tactical moves which we must always guard at all times that they do not shift our strategic vision. Uh, and that, that's why you see where we are with them, we don't allow them to lead government. We say government must be in the hands of a minority political party for these doubts that we have about them. And then they are on that side, we are on this side. In Johannesburg, it's coming up very well. They are not, we are in coalition, but they are not leading the coalition from a mayoral seat. And that particular consider, tactical consideration is is birthed by the same analysis that these people are not, have never been a real, reliable partner in the radical program. Uh, so, and they are tactical. But I, I'm saying in 2013, we came to a conclusion, you will see when the DP comes to the founding manifesto, that there's no self-correction here. Kosad was not self-correcting. SACP was not self-correcting. And they had no prospects of self-correction. Um, uh, I'm jumping some of the things because they, they are going to be part of a long session with the founding manifesto. And then 2024, it's a debate you can bring to the table. What, what must be the point of conversation with the ANC, should that conversation happen in 2024. 2024 is still coming. But we have seven non-negotiable pillars. We've always put them on the table with anybody we speak to. And have never compromised on them. Uh, Section 25 amendment, again, uh, it's not the end of the day. That's why we must win power. We must win political power. We must have masses. Then we must take political power. Then we must take state power, take state power and amend the constitution without depending on anyone else. The clarion call happened after the expulsion. The clarion call came out in June of 20, excuse me, of 2013, June 2013. Uh, the national anthem was diluted by Nelson Mandela. <laughs> The new one that has the stem, it was a marriage of the apartheid national anthem and the Enoch Sontonga national anthem. Mandela did that. That's the long and short of it. He's the one that, because national anthems DPR a declaration uh, of the president. 
So is Mandela's national anthem. The open borders, I think it will come. I want you to hear the founding manifesto first. What it says when it speaks to African unity and the immigration question and all of that. Let's pack it in my view deeply and then come to it tomorrow. I mean, after the founding manifesto. And then, um, you must never be scared of traditional leadership. Traditional leadership is an organ of society that must be engaged like the churches. You can win them. They've got young people. They've got younger chiefs. The, the power of persuasion that the DP was speaking about must propel you to go and, and win them. And we can. In case that then there has to be an open political program for the engagement of traditional leadership. It can be engaged. It can be won from the tentacles of the IFP or the ANC. Uh, it's, 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 I, I think it's, a, it's as obvious as that. They can be won uh, 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 into the side of the revolution. They can be made into Bambata again. They can be made into radicals like Bambata. Uh, the NC was not started in London. I, don't, I wouldn't like to engage in historical revisionism. And uh, the... The, the true link, actually, of Pixley is America. It's not London. It's the United States. But yes, the, the, the first petitions were very much about the British and London. That is true. And uh, it did have a lot of London mannerisms in its beginning. Even in the dress code and in its approach to politics, I agree that the founding members of the ANC did not have the militancy that is often characterized uh, with liberation formations across the world. They had very different mannerisms, I agree. But I wouldn't say the NC was decided to be formed in London. It would be news to me tonight. Because, uh, you know, the chiefs, the priests, and uh, intellectuals gathered in a genuine gathering after a long conversation uh, to, form, to form the NC and inspired by all these events, Bambata Rebellion, the Act of Union, uh, and a whole set of other events and, and decided we've got to come together and now start to fight together, not in isolation. It's an important, it's an important development. You, you've got to give them that. And then Mamawini, again, uh, uh, we, we do in the political program have a Mama Winnie lecture later in the year. And, uh, and, and, and I think there we will expand uh, clearly about her role in the liberation struggle. Uh, not tonight. It will be an injustice. Final uh, DP, before I hand over to you, I want to speak to this trade union question. We have a labor desk which is assisting workers and so on and so forth. The EFF is always wary. Uh, to start an organization is not mem papa. I mean, you must see how difficult is the student command. It's very difficult. A majority of them at the moment of its leaders, when we ask them how many branches you have, they can't answer that question half the time. It's not easy. It's not, it's not easy. It's easy to say we're campaigning for elections, we win elections. But for a proper organizational form that organizes on a daily basis the students and conscientizes them, raises their political consciousness in favor for a revolution, you, you have still to realize that. We still have the women's command to form. We still have the youth command to form. But the trade union movement in South Africa that uh, must, in my view, hopefully take shape uh, and, and there are already programs that are bringing us together on the ground are our friends in SAFTU. Uh, the labor desk sometimes, there's collaboration with assisting with them and so on and so forth. Ultimately, obviously, ultimately, obviously, we must have a solid left formation 
of, of not only the trade union movement, even within the arts, even within sports. We must have proper organizations that fall under the general ban of economic freedom in our lifetime, that are aligned to the struggle that there must be economic freedom in South Africa, not just within the trade union movement. And trade union movements, all of them, have thus far proven this particular fact that Lenin has always taught us that they, they maybe only reach um, improve f workers to reach levels of trade union consciousness. They can break out of the workplace and demand systemic changes. They require a partnership with a vanguard to plug them into the rest of society. And, and really, theoretically, that's the role of the economic freedom fighters. People who have money, ne? taxi, let's take uh, me. Uh, let's take me. I, I don't uh, wear a lot of nice things, but uh, I, I don't have uh, maybe DP. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, now he's not quite, he's wearing EFF things. Um, but I, I do from time to time as an example buy, buy um, expensive books that ordinary people can't afford. And somebody, when they see me at an expensive bookstore, or a bookstore, they say, you are bourgeoisie. Or I buy a car, because I've got a parliament salary. So I go to the bank and I say, parliament gives me this much, and the bank says, we can give you this car. And somebody says, you are bourgeoisie. It's the greatest heresy in the world. So for someone else, uh, is a Louis Vuitton. For another, is a, a Brandwood or a Sexzen or an Abita, depending on the age we live in. Class lines must be defined on the basis of your relationship to the means of production, not the products not the products, the means of production. The means to produce the products. Do you own the means to produce the products and at what scale? So in the pyramid of those who own, there are large scale owners because in the movement of capital emerges big industry in a form of monopolies. And in that process, they erode petty bourgeois, small-scale bourgeoisie who run small factories at the back of a yard, and they are able to continue producing a maharten, or a zingubo, or traditional wedding gowns. They are producing. The gown is their product. They've got a factory in the garage that is with a sewing machine, and they produce. Hardly can I call them to be the bourgeoisie. The ultimate test of the bourgeoisie is large-scale ownership. And they are often few, and they command large armies of workers. So instead of buying a Louis Vuitton shoe of 5,000 rand, wena, you might buy something else. But both of you, the person that is wearing Louis Vuitton and you who bought groceries of 5,000, you are merely engaged in consuming the products. Does it make sense? You are competing with each other on the base of the products you have no means to produce. And, and that is heresy. It is going to divert us from the real goal. But there are people when they have these products, uh, DP, they feel like they are part of the ruling class. That is their own political false consciousness. They think, no, because I am in a BMW, you may, you may call me Rupert. You may call me Oppenheimer. It's false consciousness. It's, disto it's, disto it's distortions. Mere, pro mere consumption of these products, it's not even accumulation of capital. 
It's just products. You're competing amongst products. The true line is in ownership of the production means or the means of production. The DP will take us to dinner. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk sitting down because if I stand up, I might talk, take talk for a very long time. So, and, and a lot of questions that have been raised here are going to be covered in the presentations that are, are going to come. We're going to have the presentation of the founding manifesto so that we all uh, have a proper appreciation of it. And we're going to have two separate presentations on the introduction to Marxism and on introduction to Leninism as well. So most of the conceptual issues, because some of the interventions that were made reflected a worrying level of conceptual clarity. So we will have to deal with that uh, much more clearly so that they, we don't live here with confusion. Uh, we all are united. We must unite each other. We must cause unity through uh, providing clearer political uh, education and, and, and particularly clarifying the concepts because uh, they, they can be confusion. But just a few reflections, fighters, is that the, this issue we're talking about of being number one as the role of political education for a socialist revolutionary movement, saying that it's about raising levels of class consciousness is the most important component because class consciousness liberates you from many other forms of false consciousnesses. So you know when you are young, right? you, you think that your allies, your, your class allies is your family. So there are people who get trapped in that level, by the way, for a very long time that, no, we as Shivambos, no, we are like this. They think that is how they must be defined. And then there are those who, whose consciousness is, is trapped in tribal belongings as well. And then the IFP exploits that, that they have got to infuse tribal consciousness it's not class consciousness that no, as Amazulu, we must be together, we must have our own party, which must protect the Zulu speaking people. So it's tribal false consciousness that you, you, you are forced to be in, in it. And by the way, even sometimes national consciousness is reactionary. Most of the time, where you are only concerned about what happens within your borders. In the Communist Manifesto, by the way, Marx and Engels say that the working class must unite even beyond these borders. That you must be in solidarity with workers of a different country against the bourgeoisie as a whole. Are we together, fighters? So that is... The, the that is... So... That is the most important thing. And, and, and you know, what is also worrying, by the way, is that leave the borders that were imposed on us by colonialism. Some people, by the way, even get to develop sub-regional consciousness. Like, even like uh, provincial consciousness that yeah, people are undermining the Eastern Cape here. The Eastern Cape must be represented. Like, and you think that is a revolutionary struggle. You think that is revolutionary. That no, as Limpombo want to be in there. As if that is a, a natural. At all times, we must look what, what, which class interest are we in pursuit, are we in pursuit of? What class demands? That is what we have to raise amongst our people. If in KwaZulu Natal we run proper political consciousness building exercises, the IFP will not exist. 
if we raise the levels of class consciousness amongst the ordinary people, the IFP will not find a reason to exist because people will say, no, don't bog us down to, yes, we speak the language, but that can organize us into a party. A party must serve our class interest as the working class. That is what we, we, should, we, should, we should strive to achieve. <laughs> that we must raise the levels of class consciousness amongst our people and defeat much more decisively the false consciousness that is defined alongside lines of race, not the race of tribes and regions. And we have to, to, to deal with that. Uh, that, uh, that is, uh, and the, the, the Komsambu is only res responded to the issue of the moneyed people. It's like the petty bourgeoisie, like it's they're called. So the other definition, they're called semi-autonomous peasants. They're peasants. Uh, but they've got access to a bit of money. They, sometimes they even employ some people as well. But they are not the bourgeoisie. They do not own the means of production. They are just they, they are, they are just merchants in many instances. Marxism deals with that in a, and then they've got a middle strata as well, like people who appear as if they are better off as opposed to the entirety of the working class. And the, this middle strata is distinguished from the rest of the other people with just, just monthly salary. You cancel it for two months, they're back to everywhere when everyone else is. So, so, and, and, but the entirety of that, including the petty bourgeoisie, they are part of those who do not own the means of production. And we have to raise the consciousness at all times in terms of uh, the. I think the question when there's an issue about coalition, I think the question that you must be asking is that the EFF. In Metsimaul gets twenty eight percent of the vote. And then these parties there, the DA, which has got maybe twenty six or twenty twenty six percent. And then they combine with other parties. Some have got one percent of the vote of the people of Metsimaul and in the form government. Twenty eight percent of voters in Metsimaul say that the EFF must be government and would not participate there. But parties which have got 1%, 2% are the ones who are allocating resources, are the ones who are deciding where roads are going to be built, are the ones who are deciding which informal settlements to formalize. The same in Johannesburg. Parties that have got one seat, two seats, and then ourselves who must say, no, we are not going to do that because these parties are not part of the seven cardinal pillars. So the AFF is not a sect. Like we, we, we are an organization that is revolutionary that in from time to time should determine just how do we participate in activities that are going to enhance and advance the interest of our people. Let's say the ANC gets 45% next year, we get 25% or whatever number of votes that we get and then they combine with smaller parties. Some with one seat, which will be having 0.25%. I think that is how you, get, you deserve to get one seat in parliament. Of the entire vote, 0.25%. And then those people must be the ones who must constitute the government. When 25% of the voters of South Africa said you must be government. That is the question that we must constantly ask ourselves. We're not in a, in a coalition with the ANC. We are participating in government in Johannesburg. We're going to participate in government in a ruling from next week. Speak. We are participating in government in a Tequini. And the system in it, 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 it's a result of elections. There was never any discussion because that is how it works, that the executive system of 
government of the metro of Etiquini says that if you have got this number of seats, you deserve a position in the executive that deals with government. So the EFF is represented in Etiquini and, 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 and is responsible now for real programs that are going to empower our people. Those are the questions that we must be asking ourselves. That uh, in, in situations where this a sizable mandate from a section of society, should we become a sect and say, no, it's us or nothing? So, no, a sect, a sect, it's, it's, so a sect can easily become a terrorist organization because you believe that your will or nothing must be what must, what must happen. So we're not a sect as a, we're a revolutionary dynamic organization that has got clear principles in terms of what we stand for. And, but that does not mean that when we participate in government, we must take reckless decisions and just want to be occupying positions even when we know that there's no capacity to could add any value. Sometimes we find people say, no, we want to participate in a government of a municipality which is under administration, doesn't have resources, owes ESCOM 10 billion rand. And then you say you want to be government there and in a coalition as EFF. To do what? To inherit the problems of deaths to ESCOM. And so those are some of the issues that, because uh, we must be able to deal with these issues in a much more different uh, way. Look, I think what part of the things that we're going to do as part of the 10th anniversary will be to publish because in 2014 we published this book of the coming revolution and I think we must distribute it, the electronic version everywhere, to everyone so everyone to the entire membership of the EFF let's, 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 let's have it available but the chapter that deals with the history and overview of the EFF in this book covers fairly well some of the major developments prior to the formation of the EFF and when it was it had just been founded. We can expand on the component about Marikana because I see a subsection that speaks about Marikana being the turning point in this book which we must expand on. So part of the publishing approach which we had, we had spoken about was that from the plenum was that we should do the smaller sizes of books as well. Like not these voluminous components of 288 pages. We must do the ones of 50 pages, but are succinct and clear in terms of what should happen. I would think uh, what we need to do as well, we must take, uh, we must publish the history of the EFF as a separate book, and then we're going to publish a separate book called The Seven, which will be an expansion of all the cardinal pillars. Like Now with even contemporary examples and reflections of just what did we do about each and every component of the seven cardinal pillars. I think those are some of the issues that we can be able to attend to uh, in the immediate in terms of um, what uh, should the uh, happen. The, I don't want to talk about the ANC because I used to be an ANC historian so I can talk for a very long time. But when it was formed it was, a, it was, an, it was, it was an organization which wanted to liberate primarily the educated black men. It, it didn't even agree on non-sexism by the way. They didn't allow women to be part of the leadership. But the 1912 culmination of the ANC was a direct reaction to the 1910 formation of the Union of South Africa. So the British Parliament passed an act in 1909 called the South Africa Act, which was to unite the colonies, the four colonies, into one Union of South Africa. 
which was going to be constituted by the white colonial settlers. Those that had fought and had an agreement in terms of what should happen moving forward, they fought in what was called the anglo Boer War. Kumsa Buzin spoke about it. And then the British passed. So South Africa was established in its current borders by the British colonial parliament. And then they, they, so it's 1910. So immediately after that, then these educated black men go and mobilize the congresses that were existing in different provinces. There were different organizations of black people before the ANC was formed. But they were not like national organizations or liberation movements. They were stratified. There was no nation even at the time. They were stratified. So then 1912 was to say, let us gather all these organizations to form one organization to fight for inclusion into this 1910 formed Union of South Africa. They were fighting for inclusion into the colonial government. So all their conferences, all the conferences of the South African Natives National Congress used to be addressed by the colonial government. Like the Minister of Native Affairs used to go and say, we've heard your demands. And they used to write petitions and send delegations to the British Queen because that was that that South Africa was established as per the 1909 British Parliament Act. So they used to send petitions there to say, no, why don't you include us, only us, as educated black men? So Langali Balele becomes the first president. Second president is Makato, Sifako Makato. Third president is Z.R. Mahaban from Kronstadt. They continue with the same approach of petitions. And then J.T. Gumeda becomes the fourth president. But he then takes a different approach because in 1927, he was elected in 1926, 1927, he attends the 10th anniversary of the greatest 1917 October Socialist Revolution in Russia and comes back revolutionized and much more socialist orientated to say that this is what we should do. We must pursue a socialist route. He says, actually, I have seen a new Jerusalem, and I have brought back the tools that are going to take us towards freedom. J.T. Gumed, and then he was removed for that purpose because those who found that it wanted to maintain the DNA of the ANC becoming an organization of inclusion into the white system. An inclusion of educated and civilized black men. Maybe they've achieved that. That is why we need now a revolutionary movement that is going to be about the emancipation of all black people, of all the oppressed masses of our people. In terms of their stated original objectives, they are done. They must wind up. They are done. Like uh, they are done in terms of what they because they they there is never been a a clear commitment except in some instances where there were no conferences. There has never been a collective commitment to the liberation of the working class and the poor by the former liberation movement. There have been instances of radicalization. The first attempt for radicalization was with J.T. Gumede, and the second attempt for radicalization was with the Congress Youth League of Nkolisi Majumbu, was the Congress Mbata, AP Mda, of Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe, which then resulted in the 1948 uh, conference and then they, they, they then the that that died down like later on when that generation of freedom in our lifetime gold got to be older they assimilated into the original mission of the liberation movement and were then co-opted into the same thing of worshiping the the president makes an interesting observation that why was the president of the ANC staying in London 
throughout the liberation period. Oliver Tambo stayed in London and was protected by the British government. And when 1976 happened, he condemned it, that no, this is reckless. When Sharpeville happened earlier in 1960, it was condemned as well, that no, this is reckless, it was uh, not properly planned. Only later on, opportunism rose in to say, no, let's, let, let's hijack the... So then there was beginning to be realization of the revolutionary character and potential of young activists in terms of uh, what happened. But there is not going to be any revolution that is going to come from the former liberation movement. Why? It's because the ANC characterizes 1994 as a democrat, democrat, democratic, democratic breakthrough, as a victory. Now, the EFF's characterization of where we are in South Africa it says all these battles that we have been fighting from the wars of dispossession this way, we still remain a defeated people. That is what was still a conquered people. That is what the EFM says that as black people, and there are every signs to illustrate that we are, we are a defeated people. And we are taking the struggle from those that fought before us. And we're going to run towards the finish line. So when a relay race of struggle, relay race is what the Jamaican team did, does in athletics way. It's the four of you. The first one runs the first 100 meters, takes the button to the next one. And then the other one runs until. So ourselves were taking the button because the third ones to take the button, they were running backward. <laughs> then we went to zap the button. To say you are taking the button, you are running towards the wrong direction, we are going to now run towards the finish line, which is economic freedom in our lifetime. So that is where we, what is, that is who we are as the economic emancipation movement. We will talk about most of these issues tomorrow. I agree with Commissar Mbuizeni that if we can stay up in conferences until early hours, let us be patient enough to stay to make deliberations on most of these issues, to empower ourselves. If you think it's too much, you'll have to see how we handle it. Thank you very much, comrades. Let's go to dinner. We'll come back later on. <laughs> sure. Dina is uh, Avela. Who's that? Avela. Uh, she will show you the venue now. We can leave the EFF and uh, die because everything was there. So because it's the next document, I agree with the DP that I must uh, resist resisting that we break. Also, the uh, majority of you traveled from across different uh, kilometers to come here. Let's rest after dinner. So if you check the program tomorrow, we were supposed to stop at 7 tomorrow in the evening. That means we'll stop much later. I'm warning you. And then the second warning is the exam at core resistance school. And um, Koketo, do you have the exam with you? So pass 
by the table and take the question paper and take the guidelines. Go eat and sleep. Eight o'clock sharp. Uh -uh. Eight o'clock sharp, we start here. Breakfast is being served in the hotel you are in from half past six in the morning. So, eight o'clock was starting EFF founding manifesto with the DP. Thank you. Good evening. Oh, God. 